Thanks, Janelda. Or I'm sorry, thanks, Deja, I should say. Janelda also just made me a really nice comment, so she was top of mind. Hello, beauty friends. Thank you so much for joining me today for Jewelry Making Week in the Michaels Community Classroom. I am Meredith Roddy, and I am here on behalf of Beadalon and Artistic Wire. And I'm so glad to have so many wonderful new beauty friends and old beauty friends alike joining me today. If you are new, please go ahead in those comments and just give me a little message. Let me know that you're you're new to my classes. And I'd also love to know if you've made jewelry before, or is this your very first time? Is this your first class? Did you see the project and the project description and you thought, wow, I really want to make that and I can do it. <laughs> Excuse me. I would love to know <coughs> if that's the case. Also, welcome to all of my oldest beauty friends who've been here. We've been doing these classes for two years now. I can't even believe it. It has been such a wonderful ride. And you know, if you've been here um, with me for, for these last two years, how grateful I am. And it's always wonderful to have new people as well. We have a lot of people and the comments are going by very quickly. So I apologize if I am not able to see all of them, but I'm gonna request a transcript so I can go back and make sure that I read everybody's comments afterwards. Speaking of comments, please, as I'm going along, feel free to ask any questions um, during the live class, of course, in the comments. Um, Yvette is here from Beadalon and she will be happy to provide any links or any clarification. And if she needs to interrupt me, she'll go ahead and do that and make sure that I go back if there's anything that I skipped over. Additionally, um, this class is being recorded. So in about 24, 48 hours, you'll be able to go over to the Michaels Community Classroom YouTube channel and watch as many times as you need to. So if you're not making along with me today, you'll be able to go back, skip over the chit chat and get right to the instructions. Um, and it looks like Deja is putting all of the links that you need to know in the chat. So like I said, if you're watching live, you'll be able to get those links. And if you're watching on the replay, everything will be right below um, in the little description. So I think without further ado, I've introduced myself for those late comers who are joining us. I'm Meredith Roddy from Beadalon, and we're, uh, we are ready to go ahead and take that overhead camera so we can start talking about the materials and the, the necklace that we are making today. So here we go, right? This is the Queen Bee necklace. I had so much fun making this project. It kind of, it came together as, a, as an idea. I had an idea in mind of what I wanted to make. And it just, with the colors and with all of the different bees, really, um, really just came together. And, and it's one of those times that, that it worked without too much, too much finagling and too much finessing. So hopefully it will be the same for you as well. As we go through class today, I'm going to be talking about some different variations. So if you're like, eh, the B isn't quite my jam, or yellow is not really my color, um, there are tons of different ways that you can customize this and make it your own. Part of why I'm so excited about teaching this class today, especially during jewelry making week, is all this is is crimping. So you can take the most basic jewelry making technique, crimping wire, and turn it into something pretty extravagant without too much effort. So if this is your first class, again, welcome. And please keep in mind that all you are going to learn today is one jewelry making technique. And all, all that that's all you need to be able to make amazing, strong jewelry. So for today's project, what we will be using and stringing with is Beadalon seven strand satin gold wire. Now I have in previous YouTube classes or previous Michael's community classroom classes talked about all of the different things, all the different numbers on this spool and what they mean. I'm not going to go over all of that now. I definitely, I encourage you if, um, if some of this doesn't make a whole lot of sense after today's class, go back and watch the five things you should never do while making jewelry video. Um, if you sort, I think by, um, maybe by most viewed, it will come up easily. 
And I'm sure um, Yvette will be able to post that link in, um, in the comments in just a minute. Um, but this is the wire that I'm going to be using today. So it's seven strand satin gold 015. And I chose this because I liked the color to complement and coordinate with this very steampunky vibe that we have going on. I'm using these amber colored beads and yellow um, jonquil beads. Um, and so that is why I chose the satin gold as my color. I chose 015 because I wanted it to be a nice drapey look. And I chose seven strand because I had it. I generally recommend seven strand for beginners, for people who are just starting out, who might not want to make the investment in the 19 or the 49 strand wire. But for a project like this, simple stringing, seven strand is just fine. So just a quick aside, since we do have so many new people here, I did mention that the company that I work for is Beadalon, and we are actually the manufacturer of this wire. So that's why that, that nice flag is here on our spool. We make this wire in our factory right in um, Coatesville, Pennsylvania. And so that is why, uh, why I like <laughs> to teach these classes here for Michaels and why I know more about wire and stringing than most people need to. <laughs> so any specific questions, please, like I said, if you're joining me live, go ahead and and check those in the, in the comments and I'll see. Um, and a, a really good comment just came in about seven strands. Susie says she loves the seven strand for the structure that it gives to different projects. And that's a very good point because for these, these, um, these swags or swags, <laughs> these swags that we've done, it's nice to have a little bit more structure to them, right? Seven strand, or I'm sorry, 49 strand is going to be very drapey, but I will not digress into a discussion of wire, I promise. So we are going to need a focal piece, okay? So the focal piece that I'm using today is this pendant. It's the found objects pendant. Uh, this is the part number right here. And of course, all of, the, um, all of the part numbers are included in the instruction sheet that was sent out. Quick, quick um, aside, there were a couple of typos in that instruction sheet. So as I was going over everything this morning, I corrected them and I'm gonna send that back over to the, um, to the Michaels folks. And I'm also going to post it on the Beadalon website. So I just wanted to show a couple of other things that you can make this project with. I found this really cool octopus. He was actually, had been one of my first choices, but I ended up going with the B. Um, but the octopus is a really cool, um, a really cool option. And the dragonfly as well. So sky's the limit. What we're looking for are pieces that have places of attachment. So any focal piece that you find that has these pieces of attachment will work. I also found in the strong bead section, these oct octopi, <laughs> octopuses, octopi, this would work also for this kind of project because it has all of these openings for attachment. This would be a really fun one to play around with because it's a little asymmetrical. You get some really, really neat, um, really neat effects with this. Um, so we'll need a focal piece. We are also going to need, let's go back and talk about the findings real quick. We're gonna need some crimp beads. And again, um, all of the different colors, sizes, types of crimp beads is all covered in another class. So just believe me when I say, <laughs> um, number one crimp bead is what I'm using today. And that is what corresponds with my seven strand 015 wire. So from our, my crimpy variety pack, I'm just gonna grab the gold ones. Um, you could use the copper, you could use the hematite, you could use the silver depending on your, um, on your preference, but I'm gonna use the gold ones today. Um, okay, so let's see, what else are we gonna need? We're gonna need a clasp. 
So for my class, I'm just going to grab out of the Beetle on Findings variety pack. These are silver, but any class that you have is perfectly fine to use. It's not a, a special class that you need if you prefer a toggle class, but toggle class, class is, um, is great to use for this project as well. So now let's talk about the fun stuff, right? The beads. So a bunch of different beads that we're going to need today. And again, any, any of these beads can be substituted out. Um, and I just have a couple of examples that I made in totally different styles and colorways that I just wanted to show for, um, for inspiration's sake. So this is another necklace that I made in this very same design with totally different focal, totally different beads. Okay, so just to give you an idea of where you can go with this, anything in your stash is going within reason to work. Okay, so what we are going to choose today, or what I chose today, I should say, you can choose whatever you want, are these eight millimeter dyed crackle agate beads. Here's the part number right here. And again, that's also in the, um, in the, materials list, <laughs> that's the word I'm looking for. Um, but the eight millimeter, that's what's going to be the bigger beads. We are also going to need some four millimeter of those same, well, these are yellow agates, but it's the same type of bead. It's the part number right there. We will also need some of these gorgeous, sparkly, preciosa beads. These are colors jonquil. These are bicones. Okay, so six millimeter bicones. And then we will also need four millimeter rounds. And I think you can pretty much see the difference here between the rounds and the bicones. Bicones have that little pointy edge there. The rounds are round. <laughs> and just for consistency, let's show the part numbers here really quickly. So in case anybody is pausing and writing them down really quickly. And last but not least, and I did run out of them as I was doing this project, we're going to need these metal beads. So the metal beads part number is this one right here. And they are just called metal plated multi, four millimeter by six millimeter, easy enough. And they come in, in all these different colors really, really fun spacers. If you don't have, again, any of these beads or some of these beads, substitute out, use what's in your stash. Do things in different colors. If you only have a, a certain amount of beads, do whatever, do whatever looks visually pleasing to you. Um, we have a couple of classes also in the Michaels Community Classroom YouTube archive on using a bead board and doing designing. I would definitely recommend checking those out as well um, because they give a really good foundation in what to, um, in, in different tips and tricks to lay out your design. But I've already done that hard work for you. I've already figured out the design. So we're gonna go ahead and get started making it, right? So let's see, where did my pendant go? I'm gonna grab my pendant. And first things first, you'll notice that this pendant has some stuff dangling from it. We're going to we're going to remove all of these chains from the pendant because we don't need we don't need or want those chains. We're replacing them with our beads. So I'm just going to go ahead and take this off. And actually, I just pulled that out. I don't need the top of this either. I probably shouldn't have ruined the bale because I could have used that for another project, and I can probably still salvage it. So I removed it from the um, from the card and now what I need to do is I need to come in and you'll see that these chains are attached. I'll try to stop my camera from shaking right there. These chains are attached by these little jump rings. Okay. See the little jump rings and the little jump rings have a little split in the top. So I'm going to do this carefully. Um, I'm going to take one side of that jump ring in one chain nose plier. And I'm gonna grab the other side of the jump ring in another chain nose plier. And I'm just gonna gently open that up and take it out, okay? And I would recommend saving these little pieces 
you could use them for earrings. You could use them for another focal piece. You could use them for um, uh, like an extension chain. You could use them for, I feel like my um, beauty friends can come up with lots of different ideas for what to use these extra chains for. If you have a good idea, drop it in the comments. Love to see what people have used extra pieces and parts for. But I'm just gonna take a moment and gently remove them all. Didn't wanna do it beforehand because I wanted everybody to see what the actual pendant that we were using today looked like. Um, but I am doing this pretty gently. I don't wanna like yank them off or um, stretch these jump rings out of, out of plain. There are definitely some good steampunk ideas. And I apologize if I hit my camera, I try very hard not to, but sometimes if I'm trying to see and to make sure that everybody watching can also see, sometimes that camera gets hit. So we just, we go with the punches or the, we go with the flow, we roll with the punches, but what, what do we do? <laughs> We give me, we give me latitude for being silly. That's the best thing, right? So just gently taking all of these little pieces and parts apart. And I would also love to know, um, I can see some people up wa are, are watching, um, but is anybody making along with me to die? I would definitely recommend this more of a watching project, especially because I, um, have, I've done you all a favor and I have pre-strung up all of my beads because this is a pretty stringing heavy project. And while stringing doesn't take a super long amount of time, um, that is not something that anybody needs to watch <laughs> me stringing up all of these different strands. So I did go ahead and do that all before class. So what I do in class is gonna be just slightly different than how I wrote the instructions because I wrote the instructions the way I made the project at first, but it's definitely a lot easier um, if, I, if I don't string everything along as we go. Um, and just to, just to verify, um, I'm just using two different types of pliers. This is a chain nose plier and this is a flat nose plier. You could use two chain nose pliers here, two flat nose pliers. It's kind of whatever you have um, that it, you feel comfortable working with. Again, uh, we have a tools YouTube class are in the archives that talks all about all of the different tools. All right, so now I have freed my bee. My bee is free of her chains. And so now we are going to adorn her with beauty. So the first thing, that we are going to do is um, we are going to cut, which I've already done, several pieces of wire. So we need two pieces that are 10 inches, two pieces that are eight inches, and two pieces that are seven inches. So I have those cut and strung. So these are my two that are 10 inches. Then I have my two that are, I had everything nicely organized and now I'm unorganizing it. And I have two that are, <coughs> excuse me, eight inches. And then I have my two that are seven inches, okay? And you'll see there are two more here. Those are for at the end, but I did. I strung everything up beforehand. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to start attaching everything to our B pendant. And I'm gonna go a little bit off book from how, I, um, from how I wrote the instructions, just so that when you're going back and following along, you know that I'm demonstrating the project just a little bit different, but I think that between both of them, you'll be able to get, get it, no problem. So first things first, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one of those longer pieces because what I'm doing, and we're just, I'm gonna clear some of these materials off to the side here. So we don't have quite so cluttered of a workspace. And I'm gonna leave my queen bee here so you can kind of see where we're going. 
So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna attach these long pieces here on the edges. So like I said, I have pre-strung them up and I always like to double check. It's a good habit to get into. Did I make them the same length? Let's go ahead and check that. As a matter of fact, I didn't. I added an extra bead here. Can you all see that? So I have everything set and it looks like I got my beads all right and all lined up. But here I have an extra. So a really handy little tool here are these little guys. They're called bead stoppers. Okay, I have, a, I have several different varieties here just because I happen to have a bunch of them here in my workroom. These are the little guys. These are the bigger guys. And you can find these online at um, michaels.com. And it's a little spring. These are like the handiest little things ever. You just boop <laughs> and then slide off the beads that you don't need. Ooh, that actually gives me an extra bead that I need for something else. And then slide back on the bead that you do need. And then put that little springy guy, boop, that little bead stopper back on. The major benefit of these bead stoppers is I can pick this up and my beads aren't going anywhere. There is nothing more heartbreaking than making a whole beautiful beaded strand. Maybe your design was way more complex than mine is. And you pick it up to either size it or to crimp it or to whatever it, and all of your beads fall off. It's it's the worst sound in the world, those beads hitting the floor. So using bead stoppers really helps to minimize the possibility that you're gonna lose your beads all over the floor. Okay, so now I've double checked and my beads are, or my pattern I should say is all correct. I have two at the end here, two little um, four millimeters at the end here, and all of my beads are lining up generally. It looks like I might've missed right here, but you know what, I'm not gonna worry about it for class. Well, it'll just be between you and I. Okay, so now let's start crimping. So I have my, my two strung up here again. I've got my bead stoppers on the end and I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna start learning how to crimp. And this is a great project for practicing our crimping skills. Now, I have been doing this for almost 20 years and I still, like to practice my crimping skills. It is an art um, and a science. And oftentimes crimping is not the easiest part of jewelry making. Luckily, there are many other techniques for finishing off jewelry if you don't like crimping. Um, but again, if you want a, an entire treatise on crimping and crimping techniques, go check that five things you should never do while making beaded jewelry. Um, it'll teach you everything, everything you need to know. Okay, so here's my little crimp bead and I'm using crimp beads for this project because I found that they blend in more than the crimp tubes and I'm not covering them with crimp covers. You could, and if any of these words are confusing to you at all, um, again, tons and tons of resources out there to, to learn more and put, um, definitely come and join us for all of the Michaels Community Classroom classes because it is a wonderful learning experience. Um, you wanna find, again, um, it's five things you should never do when making beaded jewelry. It's the class that you wanna look for for all things crimping. So what I'm doing is I am putting this longest piece through the topmost loop in my B. So we're just coming through that topmost loop here, like that, and then around and back through that crimp bead. This is where it's always, I just wanna take a moment to make sure that everybody can see. You can see, I can see, clearly I can't see. Let's get that guy in there. All right, perfect. So what I wanna do is I want to tighten him up, but not all the way. I don't want it tightened all the way up here so that there's no room. I want about an eighth to a quarter of an inch of wiggle room here. It gives it for a lot of different reasons, not the least of which is it makes your wire happy. That's really all you need to know. Just you want happy wire and giving it a little wiggle room makes it happy. 
Now I'm gonna come in here and this is a special crimping plier. And you can see that it has these different jaws here. There's a front jaw that's smooth and a back jaw that has a little lip to it. Let's see if I can put, that's a little bit easier to say, right? Okay, yes, perfect. The back jaw that has a little bit of a lip to it. So crimping is a three-step process. I'm gonna start in the front jaw. I'm gonna to come to the back jaw and then I'm going to go back into the front jaw again, okay? And I see a couple of really good questions are coming through. I'm gonna address them in just a second. So first things first, I'm gonna come in the front jaw. I'm gonna pull this up and I'm gonna make sure that I've got that nice quarter, eighth to a quarter of an inch of a loop there. And I'm also gonna pull my wires apart here so that they're not crossed in the crimp. I'm not a humongous fan of that angle, but we're gonna do this a bunch more times so we'll be able to see it. I'm gonna show it a bunch of different ways. And sometimes it's a little fiddly. See how I'm kind of having a little trouble because I've got this great big heavy pendant that I'm working around. So I'm just taking my time and now I'm going into the back jaw of those pliers and I'm making my crimp bead into a moon or a jelly bean shape. And then I'm coming back in the front and I'm going to press my pliers down again and complete my crimp. So what's happening is that crimp tube is coming around the wire like this. I have one wire in this compartment, one wire in this compartment, and that wire is happy because it's not smushed against each other. It's not creating any unnecessary friction or pressure. And it is the, that is the, the, the formula, the, um, I'm so sorry. Hold on one second, friends. I'm sorry about that. I had a call coming in. Um, that's the formula for perfect crimping. So I have my one up here and I'm going to leave this and I'm going to do the other side. That is why this guy is, oh, my screen is sideways. Thank you. Everyone gets to see the mess in front of my computer now. <laughs> um, now I'm going to do that other side. Okay, so that's why, again, I can't stress enough these bead bump or bead stoppers are the greatest things because I don't have to worry about these beads falling off. If you don't have bead stoppers, you could use a piece of scotch tape, but I don't like using that because it gives, uh, it generally leaves a sticky residue. I don't know if washi tape would leave a sticky residue on the wire. It's not the end of the world. You can wipe it off. Um, uh, you could use a binder clip but that's gonna make a kink in your wire that you might not want. Uh, what else could you use? Lots of different things. Lots of different things. All right, so I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna do that same thing on the other side, okay? So take my little bead stopper off. This is one of the big guys, right? There, like I said, I have a so smattering, a bunch of different ones. And sometimes if you're challenged in getting those bead or those crimp beads up, I like to just put them down on my bead mat and just scoop it up right, just like that. Okay, so I'm gonna make sure everything in this design is very symmetrical. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm going to come back around and back through here. Now there was a question that came through that I saw of why I'm not using a wire guardian. For those of you who don't know what a wire guardian is, it is a little uh, horseshoe shaped piece of metal that forms a protective barrier between your wire and your clasp or whatever you're attaching it to. And the reason why I'm not doing that is because the wire guardian's opening is not big enough to fit around these pieces or these parts, these loops here on the um, on the pendant. I think on this one, I actually did use wire guardians, you can see, because the, um, the loops that I was going through were thin enough. So I actually did use wire guardians and crimp covers. Um, so certainly something that you can do, but that's one of the things that you have to think about when you're making beaded jewelry is how am I going to, um, 
how am I going to work within the limitations and the challenges of my materials? So maybe I want to use wire guardians, but I can't because there are these loops here. Uh, there's no specific, that's a very good question um, from Tammy. She says, is there a specific purpose for the different size bead stoppers? Not really. Um, the, it, it, I always use them interchangeably. If I'm using much like bigger and heavier beads, the larger ones will be, um, will be better, um, will be stronger, but I mean, I used whatever, whatever I had. Um, and I'm not using crimp covers on this design. There are plenty of other, um, of other videos out there that will show that, um, but that unfortunately is not something that I'm going to be showing in this class today. Okay, so I have done my two longest wires and now I'm ready to move to the two, medium sized wires. I just wanna make sure because it gets a little confusing with what we're doing. Okay, so I take that back. We're actually going to go to the shortest ones. I knew that there was something that I was getting mixed up on there. You could hear the hesitation in my voice because it's a little counterintuitive to me at least, but this is the shortest wire and then this is the middle wire right there. So, my shortest wire and my middle wire. These are the two that we are going to work on now. One side, then the other side. So let's go ahead and just like I did before, I'm gonna put these next to each other and make sure they're the same. Because sometimes when I do twosies, I either add a bead or I subtract a bead. These ones need to, have to be, um, uh, I call it a big bead, little bead design, but we're gonna start and end with the, one of those four millimeter rounds. And then we'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the agate beads in between. And you might, depending on your particular, um, your particular pendant, need to judge your counts a little bit. Um, it's just, um, for me at least, it's a kind of a, Maybe I need to add one more. Maybe I need to take one away to get it to look the way that I want it to look. It's just trial and error, really. That's how I, how I came up with this project. So let's go ahead and take my bead stopper off. And again, I'm just happened to grab what I had. These are our special ends that we have at Beetle On for some bead stoppers. And I'm going to add this to that second hole down. So I added the longest to the first, and I'm going to add this to that second. And first things first, I need to pick up a crimp bead and get him up. I'm coming through my hole around and through and back through my crimp bead. And again, I'm not, I, when we get to the other side, We'll talk about all of the different things that you need to do to get ready to do that other side. But right now we're just getting everybody, everybody attached to our pendant. So again, I'm using my crimping pliers and I wanna make sure that my loops are roughly the same size as the first one. And again, when you have a fiddly component here, you just gotta kind of take it slow it's a lot easier when you don't have a camera in the way and um, a couple hundred people watching you just, just so that you know, it's a lot easier when you're doing it yourself, but we will persevere. We will make it happen. So we're doing our three-step crimping process, crimp, crimp, crimp. Let's give a little tug, not a pull, but just a little tug to make sure that that crimp, that crimp took. And Let's just go ahead while we're while we're in the rhythm of it, and I'm going to add that third strand as well. So I have my first strand, my second strand, and now we're going to the third strand and double check to make sure my strands are symmetrical because knowing my brain these days, sometimes it doesn't happen. So this looks like it is the same as the one above it. Perfect. Thank you, Wanda. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's a very nice, very nice comment. For those of you who are new, we have um, a wonderful community of beaters that we are 
grateful and looking forward to welcoming you into um, people who help each other by answering questions, people who challenge each other to take their beating skills to the next level, um, people who provide inspiration, support, cheers, <laughs> a pat on the back, a kind word when you're feeling a little down. So it's a it's a wonderful um, a wonderful community and a wonderful um, a wonderful place to be. Um, April is asking, are there any groups on Facebook for beating? Um, the first place that I would suggest going is to the Jewelry Making with Beetle on Facebook page. And I'm sure Yvette is probably already posting a link for you. Um, that is a wonderful resource um, that Beetle on sponsors for all things um, beating. And then um, once you join that Facebook, because they, um, they know, <laughs> they know everything, right? Um, they will suggest all different kinds of, um, of Facebook pages. I mean, anything that you want to learn, you want to learn wire work, you want to learn seed bead weaving, you want to learn polymer clay, you want to learn resin, any of the things that you want to learn. There are a gazillion places to do that on Facebook. Additionally, Michaels has an amazing amount of classes for, um, for all different skills, all different facets of the beading world. Um, okay. I don't know if you can hear Finn um, in the background. He is scratching. So I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to say, Finn, stop it. Stop it. Thank you. Good boy. Um, Finn will come and say goodbye at the end. So you'll know who I'm talking about. So now what I'm doing is I'm going to attach this middle strand of beads to the top strand of beads. So I, I generally, if my, if my tails are about an inch long, half inch long, it's more like a half of an inch long, and they will fit through my beads here, I'll just tuck them in. I don't really need to snip them. Um, I find if you snip them, sometimes you'll get a, a, a little bit of a scratchy edge. So I just like to tuck them in. If, if they don't fit into my beads, if my beads have smaller holes or if I'm using thicker wire, I don't sweat it. Um, I will just, I will just snip it off or I'll do the best that I can, or I'll put a, um, I'll put a seed bead at the end. There are all different kinds of ways that you can judge it um, to, to figure out how, what the best way of getting your wire back through your beads. Um, okay, so again, I'm gonna take my little bead stopper off here. I'm going to add another crimp bead on the end of my wire. And then the instruction is, okay, I just wanna double check. I'm looking at the instructions now. And again, as I mentioned, there were a couple of typos that I found. Um, so just, I will send a new instruction sheet to Michael's. So it should be, it should be fine by the time we, we by the time we get to, get to having it posted. Um, so, okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna come here and you can see, I have this crimped up here between the third agate bead and the fourth spacer. Okay, so one, two, three agate beads and the fourth space spacer. That's where I found it looked the, the nicest as I was kind of playing around with my design. I also noticed that here on the end, I have an extra spacer bead on this one. But on this one, I don't have that extra spacer bead. It's okay with me. I'm not, I'm not gonna worry about that. Um, it's just, I didn't add it. Um, and mostly the reason why I didn't add it is because I ran out of spacer beads. <laughs> and sometimes that happens when you're working on a project, right? You think that you have all the materials that you need and then sometimes you run out and that's okay. You just kind of have to figure it out and, and change the design. Sometimes the design changes from what the instructor put together and that's okay. That's you adding your own creativity to it. So what I'm doing is I am coming up and over that wire and this is all loose. This doesn't have to be tight. I find it easier to do when it's looser like this, but if for you it's easier when you already have this tightened up, 
you can go ahead and do that. I just, I think it's easier both to show and to do when everything is loose here. But if that drives you crazy, no reason why you can't do it the other way. This would also be a great place if you wanted to use a wire guardian to go ahead and do that. Again, I did not do that for this project. Um, sometimes I do it and sometimes I don't. And sometimes for teaching, it just adds an extra step that takes a little bit of extra time. And um, you don't, sometimes it's, it's just easier to not have it. Sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't. So again, I'm gonna do that three-step crimping process and I'm gonna slow that down. I'm gonna show, um, I'm gonna show that the next time that I do it. And I came back through here with a couple of my, I'm sorry, I came back through a couple of the beads I chose four. You could do three, you could do six, really doesn't matter. And then I'm gonna come in with my nippers. I actually did not talk about the tools that we needed in the beginning of class today, but we need some nippers. So I'm going to snip that off and then just tuck that tail in. So no one will ever know that it was there. So let's go ahead. I'm gonna, on this one, I'm gonna slow it down, that whole crimping process and talk a little bit more about a couple of important things. Okay, so just like we did last time, I'm gonna come in here and I'm going to tuck those tails in. I'm sorry, tuck that tail into the beads and it should go in pretty easily. And I'm gonna come up, snug everything up. Now I wanna make sure when I'm doing any crimping that I'm not crimping things too tight. One of the things that people run into when they're doing their crimping is wanting to make sure that all of the slack is taken up in their beads and there's no wire showing. In this project, it's a little less of an issue because we are moving things and, and putting them into place. But again, in that crimping video that I keep mentioning, it talks a lot about how you can adjust your spacing in your wire to make sure that your necklace or your bracelet or whatever you're making as your jewelry will not break. You wanna make sure that there is not too much tension on this wire that it will break as you're wearing it or over time. So the place to choose for this next one is I'm gonna look over and I'm gonna go one spacer bead, one agate bead, and then I'm going to attach it right here. So here is one spacer bead, one agate bead. So I'm gonna come in right here. I'm just moving that aside to give me a little bit of space. And a really astute and interesting comment just came through talking about left-handers. I wish that I need to, to have a consultation with a Southpaw to see how I might be able to talk in a way that helps left-handers learn beating. Since I am very right-handed and I'm right-hand dominant and I don't naturally think about doing things the opposite way. Um, it might be a very interesting exercise for me to think about how I can help left-handers do beta. All right, so let's talk about that crimping technique one more time. I'm using my crimping pliers and I'm coming into that very front smooth place in my crimping pliers. I'm going back to the back jaw and I'm clamping down and then I'm coming back to the front and that front part, I'm putting my crimp bead in straight up and down. And what I'm doing is I'm smushing it and I'm also rounding my pliers around to get that crimp nice and secure. What I am not doing is coming in that very front part of the crimp tool and smushing it. What that does is a couple of things. It ruins the crimp, it makes it look ugly, but it also can break the wires. So you wanna be very careful. The crimps and the tool are designed so that, again, like I showed in the beginning, that wire is cupping around and holding that wire in place. Okay, so now I have three strands on one side and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna finish off this side also. 
And just like I tucked in my tails over here, I'm going to tuck in this tail as well. And I'm going to just draw or push those beads over that wire and bring everything tight. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to come in and snip off my little end here. So I'm just gonna go ahead, come in here and do that just for neatness. If I suppose if you wanted to wait until the end and snip all of your tails off together, you could do that. I'm a, a tail snipper offer on the way. <laughs> Is that a thing, a snipper offer? Okay, so um, just by ease, and again, choose any clasp that you want. Um, I'm gonna go with a lobster claw and a tag from my handy dandy findings variety pack. I have a magnet on my bracelet and it is stuck to my tripod right now. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna do about that. <laughs> Oh my God, that's hysterical. Hold on, I have to <laughs> fix all the parts. Sorry about that. They have a little magnet clasp here and the magnet clasp totally stuck to my tripod. I'm gonna have to take that out. That's funny. Um, I would recommend if you don't have a crimping tool, I would recommend getting one in all honesty. Um, it is, if you are going to be making jewelry and you want to do it professionally, whether you're going to sell it, whether you're going to gift it, whether you're going to really even to make it for yourself. Um, I, I highly recommend investing in a crimp tool. They're not very expensive and you will, you will be grateful in the long run for having one. Um, that's really my best advice that I can give. So now I did that same thing that I've been doing for all the other ones. I put my crimp tube on, I took my wire up and around and through, and then I came through several of the beads. And this is the most important part of the, of the whole process, in my opinion. You wanna make sure, and I alluded to this earlier, you wanna make sure that you're tightening this up, but that it's not so tight as to become, see how it kind of got a little stiff there? I want my brace or my necklace or my bracelet or whatever the jewelry that I'm making to have enough wiggle room that it's not going to be stiff because especially when you're using crystals and especially if you're using bifone crystals, the beads tend to have rough edges and rough insides and under too much pressure, the, um, the beads can actually cut through the wire. And good crimping technique will minimize that possibility. So once again, just like before, we're gonna come in here and we're gonna crimp in the front of my pliers and in the back of my pliers. And then again, the front of my pliers. And hopefully I've shown this in enough different ways and enough different parts of my screen that, that everybody, gets the, um, everybody gets the crimping. And I'm gonna snip my little tail off there. And I will say that the wires, just, um, just for everybody's knowledge, the wires that I use today are a little bit longer than I called for in the instructions. I tend to um, always, especially when I'm teaching, use a little bit more wire than I might necessarily if I was just making it on my own. It's just, it's easier to show when there's more wire involved and kind of trying to fiddle in little ends. But it's always a good point to mention that what's my other piece one, two, oh, here it is. Um, that it's always good to have a little bit more wire, whether you're doing wire work, whether you're doing crimping, no matter what you're doing, um, you want to use a, just a little bit more wire. It just makes everybody's life easier. All right, I'm going to go ahead and just do these a little faster so that we can get to finishing this project. We're gonna go over a little over this hour. And I do apologize if you only had an hour before you needed to go back to work or you needed to go pick the kids up or get a, a date, I don't know, doing something fun. Um, but again, if you're not able to watch the very end of class, you can always go back and watch this class and then all of the other classes, not only by me and not only on beating, but of all of the amazing instructors um, and all of the amazing classes that the Michaels Community Classroom has, um, has offered for free. I mean, really, how lucky are we 
that Michael's does this for us. It's really been fantastic. And I would say that there have been a lot of people who have taken up a new hobby during, during this pandemic time. And like I mentioned in the beginning, this is two years now that we've been doing these classes, which just blows my mind. The world has changed so much in these two years. And I feel like we're finally starting to get a little bit more normal. I hope. Does, that, does anybody else feel like that? The world is starting to feel a little bit more normal. And then in, I, I suppose that as soon as the world starts to feel more normal, we get hit a curveball again and everything gets crazy. But we're in it together, right, friends? Okay, so I'm just making sure that I have everything, sorry, 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 tightened up on my strand here, not too tight, but not too loose. And that's always a challenge, especially when you're just starting out. Beading is figuring out that sweet spot between not too tight and not too loose. Again, you want it tight enough so that you're not showing any wire, but you want it loose enough so that your beads aren't going to cause unnecessary friction against themselves or against the wire. And honestly, sometimes all that is is practice, right? Just doing it over and over again and making sure that you're using good materials, that you're doing your skills well, you're taking your time, um, that you can see, <laughs> um, which is always a challenge and becoming a, a greater and greater challenge for me as the days go by. I feel like every time I buy a new pair of readers, I have to go up a half of a a half of a point. So back around, Finn's like, uh, mom, you should be finishing up now, but we're not quite ready. And sometimes classes take a little bit longer or sometimes projects take a little bit longer, um, but aren't you glad I pre-strung everything? <laughs> And again, sometimes your pendant's gonna get a little fiddly. So you just need to figure out how to work within and around your materials. Those crimps, nice and crimped. <clears throat> One of the biggest challenges that I have always had as a beater is pricing my work. Um, I don't tend just between you and my, you and me, I don't tend to sell a lot of my work because people generally, I have found, are able to get pretty okay jewelry for not a whole lot of money um, in all different kinds of places. And I'm not, that's not a judgment call. It's just, it is what it is. You can go to all different stores and buy pre-made jewelry pretty cheaply. For me to make something um, with my blood, sweat, tears, and creativity is a lot, my, my time and my creative energy is worth a lot, honestly. And I don't mean that in, a, in a, an ego kind of a way, but just in, a, in an actual way. I spend a lot of time figuring out a design. I spend a lot of time making a design. I spend a lot of money on supplies for design. And so unfortunately, I'm very challenged in figuring out how much I want to charge for something. So with that all said, um, and the knowledge that I don't sell a lot, I'd rather give it as gifts. Um, quite frankly, because I think that the value is more or higher in giving a gift to somebody than it would be in selling it. Um, I also have the luxury of being paid for designing and for making things rather than for selling finished goods. But the general kind of the accepted practice is you take your materials, you double them, then you add in a fair wage, whatever that fair wage is to you, whether it's $30 an hour, whether it's $50 an hour, whether it's $100 an hour. Um, 
and then figure out how long it took you to make the project and then pay yourself a fair wage for it. Um, whether or not the market will bear that and someone is willing to pay for it depends a lot on where you are, um, who your friends are, <laughs> where you're selling, how um, your reputation, um, all, I mean, there's so, so many X factors, whether it's a rainy day, whether somebody just won the lottery, I don't know, all the different things that it could possibly be um, that, would, that would affect it. Um, but that's kind of a, my, my general take on selling. Um, and people are super successful with it. Um, it's just not something that I do a lot of. I did for a little while, um, years and years ago, I would go to craft fairs and set up a booth and they were wonderful because you meet so many amazing people, but it's just, it's a challenge that I am not, um, not up for these days in all honesty. Um, it's not, it's just not something that I have the energy, um, or the strength to do. All right. So now I'm doing my second to last part and we still have to do the little swaggies at the bottom, but I'm pulling this nice and tight, not too tight, making sure I've got wiggle room at the clasp, making sure I have a nice wiggle room down here. See how I'm kind of curling this up, pulling everything nice and tight. I'm holding on to that little tag with my pliers just to give me a little bit more to hold on to. And then I take my crimper. <laughs> the thing that takes me the longest whenever I'm making jewelry is finding the tool that I just put down, right? <laughs> I'm sure the people who make a lot of jewelry can certainly relate to that. Trying the other thing that takes me long in class is making sure I have everything centered. But yeah, I spend almost all of my time looking for the tool that I just that I just put down. That's ridiculous, and that I haven't figured out a good solution for that. I think it's just kind of comes with the territory. Okay, so now I have my clasp done. I have my swags at the top and my swags at the top. And now I'm getting fiddly fingers. You can tell that it's getting to be the, toward the end of class when I start getting fiddly fingers. And again, if you do have to jump off, um, I, I appreciate you being with me. We're just gonna do that one last little part of the project down here at the bottom. So I had, I did my swag and I was really, really happy with my chat with my swag but there were two sets four extra holes here right my my queen bee my lovely bee still has some open holes so we're going to go ahead and add a little extra swag here on the bottom it might be fun to do um maybe some fringes down at the bottom or um gosh there's just a gazillion different things that you could do down here right but i have to find this is my one one strand that I did, and I know I made up the other one up here. It is. Is this it? Nope. That's the other thing that I do in all of class is look for the pieces and parts that are right in front of my face, like that one. So I have this little itty bitty guy here. He's got um, two bicones and two amethysts, and then a nice spacer in the beginning, in the middle, two bicones and two amethysts on this side. And this one I actually changed because like I mentioned, I ran out of those spacers. So I substituted out a spacer and I used one of those nice big agate beads, one of those nice big eight millimeter agate beads. Again, so you could use anything that you wanted here. Some fringe would look great, some, I mean, the sky's the limit. But I did the little one on the inside and the big one on the outside. So let's just go ahead and add those and then we will be able to call it a day. And again, um, as I mentioned in the very beginning, this is a great project if you're just starting out because even though there's a lot involved, we're just doing the same crimping over and over and over and over again. Um, and that's what it takes. It just takes practice to get your crimps really, really good. Now, if you have practiced your crimping and you're like, this is just not for me. I cannot, I just can't get it to work, Meredith. And it's frustrating and I'm finding no joy in doing this and I wanna give up. Don't give up. What I will say is that there are lots of other techniques to finishing off jewelry. You don't 
half to just do crimping. Um, like I said, it's the most traditional, it's the most secure, it's kind of the, the way that we teach proper jewelry making, but there are tons of other findings, stringing materials, um, ways of making jewelry that don't involve crimping. And we have done a lot of classes using different finishing techniques, but we have also have on the docket coming up and actually, oops, you know what I did? I attached it on the wrong one. Happens, happens to the best of us. So all I need to do, I attached it on the wrong one. I'm just gonna snip it off. No harm, no foul. Just get that snipped off. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm snip it from here. And this is why it's a good idea to use longer wire because now it doesn't matter. I have plenty of wire still left to be able to fix that problem. Okay, no big deal. No reason to beat myself up. I'm gonna come over here and I'm going to pay a little bit more attention and I'm gonna come here in the bottom one. Perfect, that's what happens. That's what I get for reading comments and teaching at the same time, right? Um, so yeah, so what I was saying is there are lots of different ways to be able to finish off jewelry. You could use stretch cord. The Beetle on brand is called elasticity. You can use all different kinds of cording, leather with cord ends, um, all different hemp and um, knotting techniques. There are special findings that don't require crimping. Um, I do not recommend flattening your crimps though which is I feel like where we're going with this discussion. It's never a good idea to flatten your crimps. Um, those of you who hang out with me a lot know that there are some situations in which I will allow it, but we don't speak of those. <laughs> we do not speak of those. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. Um, but what, be, because, and, and I, I kid, but it's actually a very serious reason because what happens when you smash your crimps flat with a chino's plier, um, you end up smashing the wire. What this wire is, is individual, little teeny tiny hairs, thin strands of wire. Oops. This guy got away from me. Little teeny tiny hairs of wire that are coated with nylon. And each of those wires, it's very upset when it gets smushed. And so that's why we do this crimping so that our wires are happy and they're being hugged by the crimp beans rather than being smashed. So um, as we're finishing up, I can let you know, um, again, I've mentioned a couple of times the Michael's classes get posted and I teach generally on um, every other-ish Wednesday afternoon. We also have Sarah Lovecraft, who is amazing. And she teaches a lot on Wednesdays and on um, Saturdays as well. You can also find me over on the Beetle on YouTube and the Beetle on Facebook page. Um, I do a Facebook Live every Thursday on all different topics. Um, soup to nuts. It's kind of a Sometimes it's whatever, whatever I feel like that day. Sometimes there's a specific reason behind what I'm teaching. Sometimes it's product specific. Sometimes we just hang out and have fun and, and talk about beating and see where, see where the, the discussion takes us. Um, so I mentioned the Jewelry Making with Beetle on Facebook page. Um, definitely um, go over to the Beetle on Facebook page and website um, to check out tons of information and tutorials and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, you can always find me at uh, my Instagram is at Meredith Joy Designs. Um, and what else? What am I missing? I'm sure that Yvette will chime in on those comments with whatever I am forgetting to mention. Beetle and Page, my page, Sarah Lovecraft. Michael's. I think I, I think I hit all of the things. And then of course, if and when you make this project or anything inspired by this project or really anything at all, um, and you post it on your socials, um, go ahead and do, use the hashtag make it 
with Michaels. Um, also hashtag Beetle on. I've also seen um, Made It with Michaels and Michaels Community Classroom, I believe, are a couple of other hashtags that people have been using when they have made um, designs for the classes. So lots of places to join the community, to join the discussion, to be a part of all of the fun. That's mostly fun, right? <laughs> Mostly fun. But again, so many great questions about wire guardians and crimp covers and crimping techniques and how do you know which which crimp to use and, and kind of more specific things than um, just the project today. I encourage you and invite you um, to come hang out with me um, in other classes and to go ahead and um, check out a lot of those archives. They're just, they're great resources. Um, that we have put a lot of time and energy into, um, into making. And it's just, it's so much fun. I just, I always say I love hanging out with people who love doing what I love doing. And that's what this beating community is all about. Now, once again, I'm coming to a fiddly kind of a situation. I can just feel it. I'm like, I'm on the back of my pendant. Everything is here. There's a lot going on. So I just want to kind of find where I can get in here with my crimping tool and get that crimp nice and crimped up, that last one. Sometimes you have to, you never have to stand on your head, but sometimes you have to kind of twist things around and look at them from a different angle. Um, and you can see, I didn't quite get that last one as tight as I could have. So it happens again when you are chatting your way through class, but we did it. We made it through the class. Hopefully um, you have learned something new and exciting. If this was your first time kind of checking it out, maybe this is something that I want to get into. I hope that, um, that I inspired you today. And again, if I did, please post on your socials, tag Beetle on, tag Michaels, tag me, tag everyone. <laughs> and welcome to the beating community. It's a wonderful place to be um, with really, really great people. So I think what I'm going to do now that I've shown off my beautiful bee pendant, I'm going to try it on. So Deja, I think it's time to go ahead and take that overhead camera. And I'm going to go ahead, open this up. I'm not quite sure I have the quite correct shirt on to be able to demonstrate this. And of course, my fiddly fingers are having a little bit of trouble with that lobster glass. So I'm just gonna hold it just for one moment so we don't take up too much of everyone's time. Let me click that off. And oh, of course I have so much else going on here. Let me hide this one real quick and we can see. Perfect, perfect. Oh, so pretty. Definitely the wrong, um, the wrong neckline, but just a glorious statement necklace that you could wear with um, really with either with a t-shirt or an evening gown, honestly. And that's my favorite kind of jewelry to make is something that will look as nice with a pair of blue jeans as it will with a little black dress. So thank you everybody so much <laughs> for hanging out with me today. Looks like Finn will not be making an appearance, but he says hi to all of the beauty friends as well. Um, if there's something that wasn't clear, definitely go back and watch on the replay. Again, I will be reposting posting the instructions. It's, it's nothing, nothing big, but there were a, a couple little, little typos that I'd like to fix so that everybody has a, a good clean copy. So once again, uh, go to the Michaels Community Classroom sign up page, check out the classes that Beetle on and all of the other amazing jewelry making and crafting instructors have coming up over the next couple of months. Um, I hope you had a wonderful time today. Thanks for hanging out with me. So it was a good one. I really appreciate it. And um, I'll see you soon. Until then, happy beating. <laughs>